just to remind everyone who I am, <laughs> my name is Brady Morris Rudin, um, one of the Aspire Fellows. And um, as part of the Aspire Fellowship, I did my teaching practice at Morgan State University. Um, and I taught uh, Bio 315 Principles of Neuroscience, which was an existing course at Morgan. Um, but, and I'll talk about this as I go through my talk, I was given the opportunity uh, to really make it my own and really model it after course that inspired me in my undergraduate education. Um, so I'll take you through sort of my thought process for uh, how I developed the curriculum for that course and some of the big takeaways I got from it. Um, so just um, by after 15 by the numbers, taught it in the spring of 2023. I had 13 students, all of them were juniors and seniors, so it was an upper level um, biology elective. I had three pre-meds, one pre-dental, and I had one with relevant research experience in Alzheimer's. So um, a lot of the, when I, on the first day of my class, I actually went around because I didn't have a ton of, I didn't have, you know, a vast lecture hall, so I was able to do this. I actually went around and asked them the motivation for taking my course. Um, so I got a lot of people who were just curious about the brain saw, you know, something different in terms of their upper level elective options. And um, some people, and the one person with research experience actually said that she was taking my class because um, she wanted to understand better what was going on in the laboratory she was working in. She was studying Alzheimer's and she didn't necessarily have a lot of the neuroscience background. And she said, I sit in journal clubs and have no idea what's going on. Like I want to be able to converse with people I'm working with. Um, so I thought it was really um, special. And, and like I said on my title slide, I was really given the opportunity to make the course that I want to teach. And I model a lot of it based off of um, the electives that I was able to take um, in undergraduate here, actually. Um, so I broke it up into a few learning objectives. First, being able to explain the basis of neural cellular communication, um, characterize the major structures of the nervous system, connect those systems to our everyday experiences, um, be able to understand the studies, be able to discuss the studies that led to our, our understanding of the nervous system, and then identify the consequences of that improper function of our nervous system. And one thing that I emphasized on the first day of the course was that while I'm introducing the students to the brain, its composition and its functions and its role in our everyday experiences, I wanted them to realize that each of these particular topics could be an entire long semester course. Um, so just to keep that in mind and that a lot of these major concepts aren't necessarily independent, but in fact interconnected. So I wanted them to really take away the fact that although we might be working through different modules, some of the information that you're going to learn in module one are going to, it's going to be applied to module six. And so it's not necessarily you're going to be learning and forgetting, but we're going to be building together. Um, which brings me to the course modules. I broke it up into six modules. Each module had an associated journal club and laboratory practical, and each module had its own exam. So I didn't have a final exam at the end of the semester. I just had um, six sort of mini exams at the end of each module. Um, taught, we started off by talking about the neuron as a cell, then we built up how cells of the nervous system communicate, the structures of our nervous system, sensory processing, how our innate behaviors are regulated, and then ending with our higher order cognition. And so the big thing that I wanted to do in this course was take it neuroscience from neurons to behavior. And so we had different levels of analyses, beginning with the molecular level. And so students would ask questions, and so I, I actually showed very similar slides to this where I was like, okay, if you were a neuroscientist, what kind of questions you would, would you ask that would um, address the molecular perspective? And so they said things like what molecules make up the neuron? What kind, or what kind of molecules are involved in cellular communication? How do molecules change the behavior of neurons? What molecules control nervous system growth? Moving up um, to the cellular level, they asked questions such as do different cells function differently? Um, what changes do cells go through in development and behavior? Do the cells of our nervous system influence each other? And what are, um, are the cells of the nervous system that we care about? And then we moved up bigger to systems, asking questions such as how do sensory systems work? What circuits are involved in movement? What, um, when do neural circuits form? And what areas in the brain necessary for memory? And then we moved up to the behavioral level of analysis. Um, students asked the questions such as how does tests or how does stress affect studying and test taking? So you, as you can see, some of the questions asked were very relevant to their everyday lives. Um, how do hormones affect mating behaviors, other behaviors? How does reinforcement affect behaviors? And do sleeping behaviors differ in different species? Um, and then we ended the class by looking at things from a cognitive perspective, where students ask questions such as, do animals have the same language? Um, are there different types of memory? What factors are involved in decision-making? And how do emotions affect testing? Oh, sorry, I messed that up. 
Um, but you know, um, anyway, so we ended on a cognitive perspective. So when I was doing this uh, course, the lectures were a mixture of active learning and group activity. So um, one thing that I did, um, and I should preface this by saying that um, I tried my best not to sacrifice on um, on material. Like I really didn't want the course to be um, challenging, but I also wanted to set the students up to be prepared for to attack that challenge. Um, and I'll talk about ways where I, I did that later on. But one thing that I did were at, um, was that every class had an in-class quiz and a muddiest point. So the in-class quiz I used for one, attendance purposes, and two, because I knew that my course was different, differently structured than other courses and that I gave them short answer exams. I wasn't a multiple choice person and they learned to love it, I swear. <laughs> um, but because of that, I had to get them to practice how to take my exams. And so for that reason, I gave them an in-class quiz every class. Um, same thing, or right, along those lines, the muddiest point we started off, or I ended every lecture with a QR code that they could scan and ask a question that they didn't necessarily get to ask in class or didn't feel comfortable asking in class. And we'd address those at the beginning of every class before the in-class quiz. So it allowed me to see in real time what parts of my lecture, my previous lecture, they didn't really quite get. And I can actually tailor some of the um, upcoming activities based off of their muddiest point, um, muddiest point submissions. Um, we also did some of some think pair shares, which I don't necessarily think were, um, I think helped, but I think there were some better activities that um, really brought home the point, specifically things where we acted things out. So on the right, I have, um, this is a schematic from a paper where I got my idea from, it's this club cell, where um, the students would act, um, would act out um, transport across uh, uh, plasma barriers, things like that. And I kind of rejigged it to call it club neuron. And I had, uh, possible lipid bouncer, and I was like, hey, you have to get into the club. Like, can you come through this door? You can go through a side door, like an ion channel or transport, things like that. So, um, and they really love that. So, I had a lot of students who wrote test answers in the analogy of club lingo. So, they'd be like, the bouncer kicked out, blah, blah, blah. So, they had to go up through the side door. And, like, anyway, I gave them credit. But, the, like, because they understood. <laughs> um, so, um, I think that the acted outs and things like that were really um, essential to the students getting some of the higher concepts. And because my class was so small, I was able to do things like that, which was really exciting. Um, like I said, the in, each individual module had a laboratory practical associated with it, which reinforced the lecture. So we did things such as um, an earthworm lab to um, assess conduction velocity. Shown here are some pictures of them doing their sheep brain dissections. Um, during the neuroanatomy unit. We did a sensory processing lab where they worked in teams and tested their reaction times when they were blindfolded, when they couldn't um, hear, when they um, had like a audio cue, things like that. Um, and we also relied on some virtual labs as well. HHMI had some really great um, virtual laboratory resources. One of the ones that we did was um, a neurophysiology lab where they virtually um, did a um, nematode dissection. Um, one thing that was really big for me was that the course evolved as I learned from my students. So one thing that sort of came as a result of doing, um, doing these module-based approaches was that I ended up the lecture before an exam making that lecture full review session. And a lot of that, uh, a lot of that was because one, I knew this was new material. Again, I wasn't trying to skimp on content, so I was trying to make it challenging, but I wanted to give them the opportunity to rise to the challenge. And two, I noticed that my office hours were poorly attended. And in, in um, trying to figure out why, um, the times where I was free was not the times where my students were free. Um, and even in the evenings, if I tried to make evening office hours, sometimes my students were working or had practice. And so building it, sort of building office hours into my class, I think helped bolster their confidence. Um, and it was something that I recognized not every course is able to do, but because I was able to do it, I saw a lot of benefits. And so, um, and so review sessions became team building activities as well. We would do part review session, part Jeopardy, where I break the students up into teams and the winning team actually got two extra points on the exam, which was a big incentive for them to actually study and come prepared so they didn't let their teams down. Um, and I did stick to it. I did give them their, <laughs> their plus two points. Um, so along those lines of the course evolving as I learned from my students, um, these were things that I didn't start off with, but 
came as the semester went on. So um, over the course of time, I actually did allow them to bring in one page of notes um, a lot in the exam, um, just one side. Um, I did make my office hours a little bit more flexible to meet the needs of the students. Um, and I also um, chose the top percentage of grades in each grading category. And I think that allowed them to grow and also reduce their general anxiety because they knew, okay, I'm going to take the best five of your six module exams. Um, and I think because they knew they had that flexibility, they were less, um, in my opinion, they were less hesitant to tackle some of the more challenging topics. So I think there was a little bit of a buffer. Um, so some of my big takeaways were that the flexibility helped both the students and me in allowing them to drop to the lowest grade for certain sections and allowing them to only have um, only use 80% of the in-class quizzes for attendance. It meant that I didn't have to deal with people emailing me that they were gonna miss class or things like that. I was like, nope, as long as you hit 80% of your in-class quizzes, I don't care where the other 20% where you were. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> like, help me help you. Um, giving sprays to address problem topics sooner via the muddiest points, via some of the in-class activities, help build their confidence and also help me address um, some of my problem areas and in turn help me build my confidence in teaching. Um, to that end, sometimes I was wrong and sometimes I couldn't remember something. And um, I actually had one student when I admitted, I was like, I came to class next, the next session. And I was like, okay, guys, I told you something last week that was not right. So we're going to go through what exactly it is. And one student actually said, well, I'm really glad you're not gaslighting us and making us, you know, and I was like, oh, okay. So you actually, actually care that I'm coming and correcting myself. But admitting those errors helped gain my students' trust. Um, and in terms of jeopardy and earning those structure points, sometimes a little competition was just the trick to get them motivated to study. <laughs> so um, with that, I'd like to thank, there were a lot of people who, I know this was one semester course, but I couldn't have done it with uh, all these people on the screen. Lisa um, hooking me up with Tim and Christine at Morgan, um, Sierra Jackson, who helped me with a lot of administrative support, which was great because I wasn't physically there. I would go, I would teach my class, and I would leave. So Sierra helped make sure that my classroom was good, that I had like printouts for labs. Same with Marshall, who would set up my lab for me for the practical. So I didn't have to worry about finding dissection tools because that things would be ready to go when I got there. So I really appreciate everyone at Morgan who helped me get the course off the ground. And then at Hopkins, um, Danny Smith, who's currently a professor here, um, gave me some of the updated versions of some of the courses that I took when I was here. So I was able to pull from her curriculum. I actually pulled from some of my old teachers, um, specifically Stuart Hendry and Linda Gorman, um, whose material I still had stowed away. And who I shot Dr. Hendry and on Facebook, like, hey, can I see you? <laughs> I need some stuff. Um, Daniel, who um, graciously guest lectured one of my classes and talked about his research. Um, and of course, Kathy, who um, offered me unlimited support and also um, understood when I would disappear to go teach and then come back. So um, with that, uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you. What was the cover way to get through the part to the party but in the club? Oh, <laughs> it depended on what you were assigned. If you were, um, you know, if you were um, good old sodium or something bigger, it depended, that depended your um or that determined your entry point. So, but I think they really liked it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Are you the money this time? Was that your idea? Um, I got that from um, uh, a Bloom's taxonomy like um book chart that I have actually. It just has like it's like a little book chart of different activities that you based on what you want to accomplish, and I would have. Yeah. yeah, it almost worked with the Rex, like when we were doing things completely asynchronously or just or synchronously, but over Zoom during COVID, students were very nervous to even ask any question in front of everybody else. And so I would sometimes even institute like anonymous polling just so that the class could see on it, on it, could average, like what would the response be? But yeah, that's a really, that's a clever idea. I like it a lot, actually. Um, and it would disappear. For the muddiest point, did you find that students often like gravitate towards the same thing, or did you have to like manage how to answer all of the questions? Um, it was always, um, I should say, always. most of the time, it was the same topic issues over and over, which again was really high for me because I'm like, okay, I did not teach that part well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Do you have any questions for Brandy before I start? Yeah, did she credit? Was it early enough to credit you as a professor, Norman, yet or not? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Doctor was sufficient. <laughs>